I think it's fair to say that this is absolutely a speculative blow off. That's the easy part. Now, the hard part is when's it going to stop? Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. Back in 1996, Federal Reserve Chair Alan Greenspan famously said, quote, how do we know when irrational exuberance has unduly escalated asset values, which then become subject to unexpected and prolonged contractions? It was a prophetic question as the stock market soon after became caught up in the mania of the dot-com bubble, reaching unprecedented levels of overvaluation, followed by a precipitous price correction. The NASDAQ didn't return to its 2000 highs until 15 years later. Many are feeling like it's deja vu all over again, with the latest run up in the small number of stocks, colloquially known as the Magnificent Seven, that are driving the market indices to new record highs today. Are we in a new era of irrational exuberance, this time around driven by the promise of artificial intelligence? And if so, what's the danger this time of another prolonged contraction ensuing? For perspective, we're fortunate to talk today with David Hay, Chief Investment Officer and Principal at Evergreen Gavco. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Adam, it's a pleasure as always. And before we get into this, I just want to say congratulations on Thoughtful Money. It is really taking off and just kudos to you and keep up the great work. Well, thank you. Um, it's always an honor to have you on here. You're always so kind. Thank you for the kind words. Um, I'm super excited because we just landed, if you can believe it, David Hay for an interview. So that one's going to be fantastic. <laughs> right. Well, hopefully right, well, I won't disappoint him. That's a, that's a high bar there, Adam. Well, you you, you won't. And uh, and you did extra homework in advance of, of this conversation, David, and put together a, a nice set of slides for us, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, but very quickly, if we could, um, let's just kick things off with the general question I'd like to ask you at the start of these discussions. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, you really caught me off guard with that one, Adam. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen I'm that one coming, huh? <laughs> I'm teasing you because I do listen to almost all your, your interviews and I've heard you ask that. And actually, it's great. I love how you cut to the chase. And to do that, it, you know, let's just you know talk about what we see coming. Well, first of all, observe. I mean, that's the first thing is observe what's going on right now. And I think it's fair to say that this is absolutely a speculative blow off. That's the easy part. Now, the hard part is when's it going to stop? And, you know, that was a great quote you read from Alan Greenspan, because I think he said he said that in 1996 mm -hmm. and the Nasdaq hit its peak at 5000 in 2000 in March of 2000. So almost four years after he said that. And I, you know, I'm not going to pretend like I saw the extent of that bubble, because I remember telling people the Nasdaq was crazy when it hit 2500 and then it went to that 5000. And so I was, uh, it was really a very painful time of my career because it was clear that it was insanity, but the insanity kept working. And you saw people like uh, Warren Buffett really struggling and then uh, amateur investors making a killing. And I think there's some real uh, similarities today. Um, all right. Well, look, uh, why don't we, why don't we dig into that? So um, sounds like you you agree that we're seeing some degree of uh, exuberance here. I guess we can we can talk about how irrational it is. Um, uh, you know, we've got stocks like uh, so we've got a small number of stocks powering the the, the general markets higher. Uh, the Magnificent Seven. Uh, you know, we've got some of the worst market breadth uh, on record. Um, you know, it's really just a very small number of stocks driving this market. Um, Stocks like NVIDIA, which the, the day we're talking, NVIDIA uh, had their earnings released the day before. And uh, I think it was the second largest market cap gain in history, day in history. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, you know, NVIDIA has been on a on a tear. It's, it's uh, trading at uh, some 35 40 times price to sales ratio right now i mean these are these are just valuation levels that are just crazy um but obviously it's got all the momentum behind it and there's a lot of people out there saying well hey hey this time's different um you know the dot com there were a ton of companies uh, that had crazy valuations yes but they didn't have any any uh, earnings um now we have companies like nvidia that have gargantuan earnings and so you know maybe these these valuations are justified this time around 
Um, how, how different is this time truly? Well, let's go back to that 1999 era, which uh, was interesting. I told you how painful it was for me, but what really kind of saved my career was a company called Qualcomm, which actually I bought during the Asian crisis of 1998. And it was kind of a value stock. I think it was a little over one-time sales. And it actually, if you go back and look at Qualcomm in 1999, it puts NVIDIA to shame. I mean, it was up like 1,500% in 1999. But like NVIDIA, it was heavily earnings driven. I mean, they did have an absolute earnings blowout and sales blowout during that period, but it got way, way overdone. So that when the tech bubble did finally burst, uh, Qualcomm got crushed too. And I'd say that's a bit of a, a warning for people that are uh, really smitten with uh, NVIDIA right now. And, you know, what I think is going to happen at some point, I have no idea when this quarter that I'm going to describe is going to happen, but at some point, they will post a quarter that might be very good, but not good enough. And we haven't gotten to that point yet. We didn't know, you and I talked earlier in the week, and you and I both suspected they were going to have probably pretty good num numbers. But I do think at some point it's inevitable they just won't be good enough. And But you've got a, a visual here on just AI and kind of AI Uber all us, which it is. This is, I think, what's different versus what happened in the, uh, the tech bubble. There wasn't you had the internet. So the internet was was relatively new back then, whereas AI is relatively new today. So in that way, there's similarities. But this AI thing came after the, you would have thought that the tech bubble had actually burst back in 2022. And you could have said, well, maybe that's similar to what happened with the tech stocks. You may remember in the Asian crisis uh, in the summer, fall of, of 1998, they got absolutely nuked. In fact, it was so scary that the Fed actually cut interest rates uh, before they went back to raising them again. But anyway, there are some parallels. I mean, I think if you look at one of your images here that's uh, on the valuations of IT and, and communication stocks, comparing it now versus then, it's very similar. All right. Um, and is that in your slide presentation? Should I pull yeah, that up, David? Yeah, you've got, the, you've got the AI images, kind of some cartoons. They're actually the front page of The Economist. And I think that should worry people, given the fact that The Economist is so often wrong way quirk. And usually when they're highlighting something, in a positive way, you want to go the other way, and right, it's, it's sort of sort of the curse of the Economist cover story, right? Absolutely, they're they're one of the worst. But you know, right now AI is is got just enormous momentum behind it, so it's probably going to take a while for that to play out. But then if we look at the next one, I mean, you really see this is, is an amazing parallel with what happened back then. Uh, now, I will say that the valuation of the Magnificent Seven, which now includes Nvidia as as minus Tesla. You know, it's, it doesn't look outrageous given, you know, the rapidly growing earnings. NVIDIA would, has been the most expensive, but earnings revenues have quickly caught up. I think where you really have the kind of 2000 type of overvaluation, that's when the NASDAQ was trading at around 100 times earnings. Uh, but you get a level below the Magnificent Seven to these companies that are highlighted every week by Investors Daily with their leading stocks. And it's very common to see companies trading at 70, 80 100 plus times earnings, if they have any earnings, or at very high multiples of sales if they don't. And uh, to me, that's where you're really going to get you know, the bloodbath. Uh, I don't think it's going to be the Microsofts or Amazons of the world that go down a lot. And you know, just look back to 2022. A lot of these things hit their crescendo in, in late 2021, and they went down 80 to 90% in 2022 when the NASDAQ was down 35. So I think you're going to see a replay of that kind of a shakeout with these lower quality companies, many of whom I've never even heard of, but I'm in the business. So that's, uh, you know, I think that's a little bit different twist on perhaps where the really extreme speculation is right now. But I think the facts bear it out pretty well. Uh, you've got some other good visuals here that kind of get to the point of, are there some replays of what happened back then? You've got the semiconductors, as you were saying, uh, the, the multiples of sales overall are getting pretty up there. And as you're aware, you get up to 10 times sales, and that's generally considered to be bubble territory. And we're, uh, we're obviously pushing that, and that's including some you know, relatively pedantic uh, semiconductor companies, and they're not just NVIDIA. We get to the next one. Uh, it, you know, People, I think, look at last year and go, gosh, how come I didn't make more money? Well, this, this visual, I think, would tell you why. And that's also very similar to what happened back in that 1998 to 2000 period in fact, most stocks went into a bear market in the spring of 1998 and stayed that way until the tech bubble burst. And when the tech bubble did burst back then, 
it was the value stocks that actually then performed quite well uh, during that bear market, which actually took the NASDAQ down almost 80% and the S&P went down roughly 50%. So it's, it's not a bad idea at this stage to be looking at companies that aren't quite so inflated in value. And uh, we're going to go over some names at the end that actually also have momentum. And that's kind of the, the best of both worlds. The other thing we could look at is just is kind of another way of seeing this narrowness, this market halitosis, the bad breath that you were talking about earlier, <laughs> when you look at the uh, equally weighted. So this just takes the S&P 500, every company 1%, as opposed to, as we know, a very cap weighted market. In fact, a pretty amazing statistic. This is the NASDAQ, but in the NASDAQ, 10 stocks make up half of the NASDAQ's value. It's just, you know, really quite stunning. And this hey, is what David, so, so, sorry to interrupt, but on, on that point, you, you talked about how um, a lot of smaller stocks sort of pre-crashed going into the dot-com uh, bubble burst. Absolutely. Um, and, and then we had, you know, these dramatic 50 to 80% corrections in the major indices. Um, <clears throat> given that we have even more concentration this time around, do you see that we could potentially have that big of a decline or perhaps even greater given that so much market cap is in so few stocks now? Well, I, I mean, I think it's going to be painful, but I don't think it's going to be an 80% NASDAQ wipeout replay uh, for the reasons we talked about. I mean, you know, Microsoft trading at 30 plus times earnings, maybe it corrects to 25 times, but it's, it's these other companies that have much weaker franchises and in many cases, much higher valuations that I think is going to be where the real carnage is. Got it. All right. So th 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 those will be, you know, maybe maybe in the 80% range, but because they're such a smaller percentage of the overall indice, they're not going to pull the indice down as much. I think that's fair. I, I just don't see an 80% NASDAQ decline coming up. Okay. That doesn't mean it couldn't be 40 or 50, which would not be a lot of fun and, and catch, catch a lot of people off guard. But, you know, maybe that's because we, you know, the, as I was saying earlier, we're, we are seeing tremendous acceleration, tremendous momentum and breakouts. So that is an important point to make is that we are breaking out to new highs in the S&P and the NASDAQ 100. Uh, the NASDAQ itself hasn't broken out yet, but it may. And I'm, as you know, I'm a huge fan of breakouts. We're going to talk about some that are doing the same thing, but with, in most cases, very reasonable valuations. And to me, that's the way to play this market in a, in a late stage phase is with companies that have you know, maybe they're trading at 10 times, 11 times earnings, but they're also making either new multi-year highs or new all-time highs. All right. And I'm curious, if you look at the past year on this chart here, um, you know, it's been positive growth for um, the, the general S&P, you know, pretty much since the very end of 2022. But uh, the equal weighted uh, index, you know, up until kind of near the end of last year was negative and it's it's now all of a sudden making a run is is that does that is that like a late stage sign uh i'm not trying to i'm not trying to bias the data here but but you know is it sort of finally it's catching a bid and is that what tends to happen right at the end or is that something that happens elsewhere in the cycle well it sure didn't happen as you mentioned earlier back in 98 to 2000 i mean they just kept the the smaller companies kept lagging until the bubble burst, the, the tech bubble burst, and then the money went into value. Uh, it's it's interesting. We did have this broadening out that you just described happen last summer, last June. And that was one way I thought we could resolve the bad breath that was at that time, was to have the broader market kick in, which it did. But it didn't kick in very long. And then the tech started to roll over in July and, and went through you know relatively, uh, you know, well, maybe not a serious correction, but a, a definite correction that lasted until late October. And of course, that's when everything took off. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's what I would say is if you want to bet on this bull market continuing, I think you'd want to be bet, betting on it broadening out. And, you know, that's there are viable ways to play that. If you flip to the next page, the next visual, rather, you'll see that it's, you know, so far it isn't happening. It's, uh, you know, it's just more of the same, frankly. Yeah, so actually, I, you're right. I should have waited to ask my question until I saw this chart here. <laughs> Well, but but as you can see in that in that red line, there is a little bit of a little bit of a catch up, although the gap is still huge. And you know this this is what's I, I find really perplexing is that we're talking about a market that is so white hot, at least in you know the leading stocks, and yet 
we look at the overall situation, because I know a lot of times you say, well, what's your assessment of the global financial markets and the economy? And the economy is a very different story than the markets. And I think you mentioned uh, here on one of your recent uh, shows that you've got a technical recession in Germany, technical recession in the UK, technical recession in even Japan, and then China's economy is very recessionary for it. So it's an odd time. And, and one of the things that, that I think is has really been uh, a, a knuckleball, frankly, for people like me who've been expecting a recession, even in the U.S. for a while, is that we had this doubling of the federal deficit last year from a trillion mm -hmm. to two trillion. And I know you've had Kevin Muir on there. I'm a huge fan of Kevin's. And he's pointed out, you know, people missed the fiscal stem. And I did. I didn't think we were going to double from a trillion to two trillion last year. It's, it's absolutely inconceivable, is that great word from Princess Bride, that that's happening at a time when the economy is healthy. Very hard to have a recession when you have $2 trillion deficits. And the budget office is saying it's going to come down to $1.6 trillion. I question that, frankly. Uh, and if you look at the way that this fiscal year is trending, it's actually trending for even a greater deficit. So once again, it's going to be tough to get a recession in the U.S., I believe. But it's also you know, what I'd call pseudo-prosperity. And I'm the first to admit that pseudo-prosperity is still prosperity. But this isn't healthy. It's just... And, you know, Charles Gov, and I want to give credit to my partner firm at GovCal because they provided these slides, uh, but Charles wrote a, a very good piece recently where he pointed out if you're buying stocks in a country where the economy is being juiced as much as it is by unsustainable uh, deficits, does that really deserve a high multiple or does that deserve a lower multiple? And if you go to the next visual, you'll see some of the stuff that we're talking about where it's, uh, you know, you could really make... Oh, uh, I apologize, because that this is an important point to make versus the 1990s. And this is actually kind of a bullish uh, take on it, which is that back then IPOs were going nuts. It actually kind of went nuts uh, in the mid part of that decade, but we're still running at a very high level in 2000. Whereas today, you know, yeah, they had their big surge back to 2021, didn't get up as high as they did in the late 90s, but they're at a very low level. And the reason this matters is this is supply, right? So if IPOs are at a low level, then there's not a lot of supply. Now, there's some signs that's starting to change, but you know, I got to say, you probably would chalk this one up to the bulls. But to get back to this theme of not, so if we go to the next one, this is not very bullish. I think this is actually quite ominous long-term, is just how much capital the government is sucking in and you know what that's doing to the private sector. I think you could very well make the case that the private sector is in recession uh, right now, and you know, not by every part of it, of course, but some major segments are very recessionary. And if we look at the next one, we're going to get up to a Lacey Hunt one coming up here in a bit, but this is the idea that <clears throat> the, uh, you know, the, just the contrast between the, and that this is probably the reshoring, this is probably the CHIPS Act and all this where we're really trying to, to bring the industrial base back in the United States and to do it in a very, very short period of time. But you do worry about this allocation of capital. But really the next one is kind of the, the the key, which is this idea that as the government spends at a higher and higher rate, what it does is it hurts productivity. And while you and so this, I think this is a critical point because I think Lacey Hunt is dead on about this. That while all this spending is kind of like crystal meth, you know, like the Nazis that were taking crystal crystal meth during the early days of the Blitzkrieg, and mm -hmm. they, you know, the enemies thought they were super, superhuman, but of course that wore off, and then they crashed and were pretty worthless and. That's the problem with this heavy degree of fiscal stimulus is it does create the sugar high or caffeine rush or whatever you want to say it and then say about it, but then you go the other way and it actually hurts. And just look at how much the government has spent since 2000, how high our deficits have been, how much debt we've taken on, and yet our growth rates have been consistently disappointing. And I think that's going to be the real shock to the bulls over the next couple of years. I think you even had a guest on recently was talking about this, that we're going to be hitting this phase where the drag from excessive government spending starts to kick in. So I think that's something you know, raging bulls should really be aware of. All right. Well, people have heard me beat the, uh, the lag effect drum uh, so much, um, uh, both in terms of just the, uh, the deflationary forces of all the rate hikes and stuff that we've done, but then also to your point, uh, the, the negative multiplier that, uh, that government spending um, is 
creating on the economy. And you know, the big question that you've already raised is just, okay, well, how long is it going to take, right? <laughs> yeah, and a factoid that I really don't hear brought up that I think is absolutely sobering in this regard is if you compare federal deficits to S&P 500 total earnings, they're about the same. And that, to me, is absolutely staggering. One thing I did get right last year was I did say there was going to be a profits recession, which there was. It was a pretty mild one. But as you know, when the government runs big deficits, that's like rocket fuel for corporate earnings. The fact that there was even a mild earnings recession with a $2 trillion deficit is absolutely astounding and I think should get a lot more criticism than it gets or well, derating well, of PE multiples. Let, let, let me ask you this question, which I've asked a few people recently, David, just, just to get your your general thoughts on it. Um, we've, we've, we really crossed a Rubicon when COVID hit in terms of um, what intervention the government was willing to do, right? The, the, the scale of the intervention that the government was willing to do. I don't think anybody, if you'd asked them in 2019, uh, if, if you could have imagined how many trillions in both monetary and fiscal stimulus were released in the next two years. I, I think people wouldn't have believed it if you had told them, right? Um, sure. We are now, uh, you know, we're through the pandemic, uh, economy is back in action. Um, we're, we're now, you know, being told that everything's great, Goldilocks, right? That we've got four plus percent GDP growth and unemployment still remains down near, you know, record lows and inflation's coming under control, right? And yet to your point, we are deficit spending at a, at a percentage of GDP that we've rarely if ever done. And, and when we've done it, it's it's been during a full-blown wartime, like a world war. So uh, the extreme has now kind of become business as usual. And so my question is, is uh, what's the probability that will dial it back down because I have a really hard time seeing the po picturing the politician who stands up and says, you know what, we we've overdone it a bit. Now it's time to rein in the purse strings, tighten our belts. You know, we're going to have to embrace a little, a little austerity at this point in time. I forget for even forgetting that it's an election year where I think the odds of that are even lower. I just, I just don't see the political uh, stomach. For, for dialing it off of 11 now that we've dialed it all the way up to that. Well, you're exactly right. And if you look at the leading uh, two presidential candidates, uh, and neither one of them has shown any inclination to try to be you know, fiscally sound. So I think you're exactly right. However, that does lead to a very good point is, you know, what is going to you know, be the, you know, you know, cut the Achilles cord on this thing. And I think it's going to be the bond market. And I think it's important in any discussion like this to, to talk about bonds. You know, there's so much focus on stocks. But, I mean, how does the government finance itself? I mean, for a while, it was the Fed, and the Fed's what I call the magical money machine, the various QEs. But right now, the Fed is still doing QT, quantitative tightening, the opposite of QE. So where is the government going to get the money that they need? Because, as you're aware, I mean, it's not just the, the $2 trillion for the new deficits. It's also the rollover. There's going to be about $9 trillion of rollover over the next 12 months. So $11, $11.5 trillion needs to be raised. And the bond market is showing signs of not being you know, enamored with the fiscal situation. And I think that's particularly true overseas. And we are seeing the, some of these central banks from foreign countries that were big buyers of treasuries that are now big sellers. And we know the banks are sellers. They're, you know, they're under stress. And of course, the Fed, as I said, is selling. So you got a lot of sellers with not that many buyers, especially at the long end. Short end, there's plenty of buyers. But if there is a buyer strike, with longer maturity treasuries and the treasury yields spike like they did in the third quarter, you know, that will really come as a shock to the bulls. And one of my 10 surprises for this year was that we would have inflation start to pop up and we would have interest rates rise, which so far that's one of my better calls. Now we can talk about gold miners as one of my worst calls, but maybe we'll get to that later. But yeah, I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna be the bond market that calls, uh, you know, calls the game over here for this absolutely out of control federal spending, which is creating this illusion that everything's okay. Everything is not okay. I mean, you got half of Americans that are worried about a civil war. You know, the other thing that leads me to is I've been interested in how many of your guests, really, really bright people, and some who are bullish, who say we're in the fourth turning. Neil Howe's belief mm -hmm. that we're in the fourth mega crisis. Uh, or the fourth, uh, the first mega crisis since the World War II, the fourth one, I think, in the history of the United States. Uh, and I think that's right. 
And how that squares with a raging bull market, maybe you could explain that one to me. Well, I mean, you're putting your finger on an issue I talk a lot about on this channel uh, of late, which is the fact that, you know, so much of, of the wealth and the opportunity is concentrating in the upper echelons of, of society into fewer and fewer pockets. Um, and, you know, that cohort still spends a lot, you know, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think we're at the point where people are beginning to wake up to, to, to just how maybe unfair the situation is. And, and, and obviously, uh, it, it takes a while before people get really shaken out of their, um, their status quo to be willing to, to put the status quo at risk. Um, and, uh, I think we're in that process that in between process where we're seeing the, 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 the bottom 80%, maybe bottom 90%, um, they're trying to continue as they have been. Um, and you know, we're seeing revolving credit skyrocket, right? We're, we're now seeing defaults begin to kick up in, in auto loans and credit card debts, not yet housing so much, but, but that could be coming soon. Um, so, you know, when, when it starts getting to a high enough pain threshold, you know, then I think maybe the, the, the majority of the public starts considering alternative action. But but right now, I think everyone's just so focused on trying to get through the day uh, that they're not yet ready to reach over for the pitchfork. But but who knows how much longer that might be? Well, I think you're right. I think that that's very true. And it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like the stock market. We talked about how narrow the stock market is. Well, that's really true of our natural wealth, too. It's become very narrow. It's uh, and, you know, things are healthier when they're broad. And right now they're not very broad. Well, and they're not. You so actually, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, if you just go to the next visual, this is actually another interesting way to look at it. This is really looking at, the, at how dominant, unbelievably dominant the U.S. is in terms of the world's market cap, 70%. And if you go back and you look at that 2000 period, it was way, way, way below that. And what's interesting is U.S. percentage of GDP is actually down. Uh, and so if you look at US GDP relative to global GDP, it's, uh, you know, it's it's off the lows, but it's way below where, where it was, uh, you know, roughly 20 years ago. That's not healthy. That's not sustainable. So that's is, that, is, that a, is that generally a sign of like multiple expansion here, which is that we're just we're, we're, we're valuing our, our national income at a higher rate than we were before? A lot of it. I think, you, to be fair, you have to say that uh, U.S. profit margins have been exceptional compared to the rest of the world. And a lot of that is due to the Magnificent Seven. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's to be fair, there has been, uh, you know, some fundamental drivers to it as well. Uh, the question is whether they're now being over discounted. And I, I would tend to lean that way. All right. Well, look, back, back to kind of what could end this party. And, and if you've got more charts you want to go through first, feel free to to, to push this question off, but you you said that the bond market really could be uh, the thing that that uh, you know would represent the cops showing up at the party, right? Um, and we did see a bear steepening uh, in the yield curve, um, what Q three of last year, um, for a period of time, and we had a little, you know for a little while there, there was a lot of discussion on on you know how that was taking folks by surprise and what that implication could be going forward. Um, Rates then came on, or yields then came down uh, heading into the year, but they're creeping back up again here. We're at what, like 4.3 on the, the 10 year right now? Yeah, it's up 50 basis points from the low in December. That's a lot. Okay. So um, you, you, you talked to, about one of your uh, predictions for the year is that, that the bond market could surprise people by uh, continuing to steepen from here, start trying to take the punch bowl away. Um, how much of that is is connected to inflation expectations versus just uh, the bond market just beginning to say, "Look, I'm I'm getting real worried about all this uh, this uh, you know oversupply of government debt and the fact that nobody wants to buy it." Well, I think it's both. If we go to the next visual, you'll see what's been going on here with inflation, and this is the you know the thing that's been a raging debate, and a lot of your people have talked about it, which is you know getting inflation down from say nine percent to four percent is relatively easy, especially when, you know, the supply chain opens up and you've got a bear market at commodity prices. So a lot of this disinflation has happened with goods. But now what we're starting to run into is the, the services part, which is a lot stickier. Now, I know that there are, you know, the bulls on low inflation, uh, and I have to some of my good friends would say, yeah, but now you're going to have rents really kicking in and coming down. And I think there's validity to that for sure, because it's a very big part of the CPI. But 
And some of these services numbers lately have been really shocking. And one that the Fed looks at is the uh, the core services X housing. And that was running at 10% annualized here recently. And if you look at the services prices, PMI prices paid, it jumped from 57 to 66, roughly, the most recent month. That was a big, big number. So we're starting to hear more and more people say, look, the problem is going to be inflation coming back up because we've got kind of this embedded inflationary forcing uh, that's a lot of it's come from these wage contracts, many of which yeah. have been signed for multi years. And, it, you know, people say, well, that's just a unionization, but, you know, it's a competitive marketplace out there still. Uh, you know, there are signs the jobs market is weak and I'm sympathetic to that. But I do think you continue. I mean, this is an amazing fact. If, if I haven't shared it with you before, the average UPS driver today makes one hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year, including benefits. Hmm. We're hearing people in, you know, that work in hotels in New York at you know low levels making one hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, the Wall Street Journal just had a great article about how high food prices still are. So you've got this situation where maybe the increase isn't, you know, it's definitely leveling off, but it's still at a very high level. And if it starts to turn back up, which I think we're seeing signs from these visuals here that that's occurring, and that's going to be you know, a major issue for the bond market. Great point. Let me let me ask you maybe an impolitic question here, but um, you know, in Love goods it. in goods inflation. Um, you know, you, you know, pr prices that have spiked due to shortages of supply or, you know, input cost inflation or whatever, um, those can come down, right? The, 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 because producers basically say, oh, you know, like there's there's a lot of margin to be made in this this part of the the, the business now, and so you know, eggs are selling for you know, whatever, 10 bucks a dozen, you know, everyone's going to make eggs, right? And then you get an oversupply, prices come down, they, they, they tend to sort of self correct. That's the, the cure for high prices is high prices theory, right? With, 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 with wage based inflation, it, it's not so much like that. It, it's, it's, once you've increased somebody's wages, it's, it's very hard to decrease them, especially if it's a salaried employee, um, Obviously, if minimum wage laws are changes to to boost minimum wages, like up, out here in California, you know we we've got a, a new minimum wage for fast food workers that's kicking in. That's that's all of a sudden now paying them twenty bucks an hour, right? Um, very it'd be very hard for that to all of a sudden just say, ah, you know what, we're we're going to go back to sixteen dollars an hour, right? Um, so uh, that's why the the services side tends to be an awful lot more sticky. And and is it is it fair to say that the the only real way to provide relief in terms of of reduced prices on the services side is is pretty much a recession. A recession has to come in and you know basically decimate a lot of demand and jobs, so that workers are all of a sudden in a different mindset where they're like, well, look, you know, a, a reduced wage is better than no wage. Yes, yes, I think that's the conundrum that at some point the Fed is going to have to face because you're exactly right. It's a lot easier to get goods inflation down and, or have disinflation, even deflation. We've had a tremendous amount of that uh, over the last, I mean, really since the uh, the invasion of Ukraine, ironically, that was pretty much the peak in almost all commodity prices. Uh, you know, uranium is a notable exception. But uh, then once you get these these wages in place, these wage increases in place, those, those are really sticky. So that's, uh, and the services element of the economy component is about 70 percent so what's happening there is really critical and so you now what if we start to see commodity prices rise again and i would say particularly and i know we're going to talk about this in a bit the most important energy commodity out there or most important commodity energy in that is would be oil and I, that's where you, i think you're going to see some problems arise arise your your term so yes, you're exactly right. Now, what's happening in the labor market is that because it was so difficult to hire uh, employees there for you know, during the COVID period and post-COVID period, so employers are very clearly reluctant to, to fire people. But what they're doing is reducing hours. So hours work, and I'm sure you've seen some of these charts, are coming down at a rate reminiscent of right before the Great Recession. So first you see hours cut, then you see people cut. And that's why I'm not as sanguine about, uh, you know, the soft landing as a lot of other folks are. So very good point, Adam. And, and on, on the people cut side of things, um, my, my read of historic data is that when companies make the shift from 
all right, I got to try to keep my employees for as long as I can to, you know what, I'm not going to make it, I, I got to start, you know, cutting costs just to, to survive going forward. Um, it's sort of like a watershed event, like, like the, the unemployment rate, when it does start moving up, it tends to move up quite fast heading into a recession. Like it's not like a slow build. It, it tends to be like a, you know, it's a, it's a basically a change in sentiment on the employer that just said, I'm, I'm shifting from hoard mode to purge mode. Um, and so, you know, j just be careful because if we do cross into that, uh, if, we, if we do cross that, that line of transition, you know, the, the situation could change pretty quickly. Now that's really been the historical present. I think this time it's being pushed out of it just from what we talked about, that the, there was such a shortage of workers for so long that's still in the memory of business owners. So I think they will try to avoid that. But you are seeing, in a you know, very dramatic fashion, a drop-off in full-time employment. So if you look at the last three months, full-time jobs are down by 1.4 million. Part-time jobs are going up. Right. And there's some kind of weird things about the way that gets reported with the non-farm payrolls, counting even part-time jobs is multiple jobs. So if there's somebody's working three part-time jobs, they consider that three jobs. And there's also, I, I heard a great uh, podcast here the other day where the point is that you're, where you're seeing uh, some growth in employment is at very small enterprises, which tend to pay less than, you know, the big companies. I mean, there's just a proliferation of layoff announcements from these you know, big blue chip companies. I mean, layoffs are really starting to spike up there, which would seem to indicate, you know, to your point that maybe we're at that juncture where we are going to start to see the official unemployment numbers look look worse. It's been surprisingly strong, but uh, you know they're very subject to downward revision, in my opinion. Yeah, and I've talked a lot on this channel about the, the high degree of suspect of, of the, the BLS jobs numbers. It seems that uh, uh, every time they test your your tolerance for credibility, the, the next report is it's even more extreme, even to the point now where a lot of mainstream people I see that the, the last payroll report came out, uh, I saw a lot of general mainstream cheerleaders say, man, I just don't think I believe these numbers. Now, th that being said, I'm not trying to say we're at that precipice yet, although I agree with everything you said, David, that we're seeing a resurgence and uh, in uh, layoffs, and we're seeing uh, hours getting cut, and and, and all, all the preliminary signs you would expect to see. But uh, I just wanted to underscore that that uh, uh, we tend to fall into an unemployment problem very quickly, and it take, tends to take everybody by surprise with how swiftly it happens. Um, and uh, you know, yes, I think it's been largely pushed off for all the reasons we talked about: the extreme amount of labor hoarding that's gone on this time in the cycle. Um, the companies that are just hoping the Fed's going to ride to the rescue with rate cuts, uh, you know, uh, to, to save them from the upcoming maturity wall and all that stuff. But if we do get to a point where, you know, the corporate fleet finally just says, you know what, the cavalry is not coming in time, I got to start letting these people go. Uh, that's something that could drop us into recession much faster than the market is currently expecting. Again, not predicting it's going to happen this year, but I could certainly make a good argument for it. And I just want to make sure that people are keeping an eye open to that possibility. And I've certainly been very attuned to that and very sympathetic to that viewpoint, but I do think we have to concede that it's it's tough to get really a true recession when you've got this kind of fiscal stem still going on. That's yep. why I would come back to the bond market. As long as the bond market is fairly calm, then I think this can continue. And the other thing that, again, to give uh, you know throw out a, a bullish piece of very important data is what's happened with credit spreads. And I think credit spreads are just as important as interest rates. As you know, that's the difference between what corporations pay to borrow money and what the government pays. And that was one of the big problems with 2022 is credit spreads, as rates were going up, credit spreads blew out. And junk spreads got up to 600 basis points, 6% over treasuries. Now they've come back down to about 4% over treasuries, even maybe a little below that. And so you've got fairly tight credit spreads and really very little sign that they're widening. And that, that actually happened coming out of October where you had the big decline in rates. So the 10 year treasury went from over five to 380. And at the same time, credit spreads came down about 100 basis points. And that was just, you know, light a fire under stocks and bonds. Uh, but if those spreads start to widen out, I would be much more concerned than I am right now. And what, it, what could be a little bit of a carry in the coal mine is what's happening with triple C spreads. So triple C is low rated junk, truly junk, junk. And those spreads have widened kind of sharply lately. So maybe that's a sign that uh, there is some trouble coming. 
And if somebody wanted a, a great heads up, I'd say, you know, follow credit spreads. They, they are extremely impactful on financial markets. Um, I'm, I'm maybe jumping the gun here a little bit, but um, do you have any sort of preferred way for playing a, a blowout in credit spreads? Well, I mean, the simple way would be to sell down, uh, you know, like your junk bond holdings. I mean, that that would be the area that would get hit the hardest. If you're really aggressive, I guess you could short some of the junk ETFs out there. You know, I'm a pretty uh, determined shorter, believe it or not. I'm one of the few still alive. I have a long short portfolio that I run for myself. I'm not doing that right now, but it's sort of tempting. I, I think where you're going to see the, the problems would be at the lower rated tranches. So in the junk market, the triple B segment, which has actually been a growing part of it. So that's a good thing. It's higher quality than it used to be. Those guys have very low default rates where the real the real risk is is in those triple C uh, rated bonds. And and there are some some funds out there, some ETFs that are more heavily exposed to the lower levels of the junk market. So those would be ones I would target negatively if, if you wanted to play that game. But otherwise, I would be taking profits on some things that have really run up here because of the decline in rates and the narrowing of spreads. But it's a uh, it's pretty mixed, as you know. I mean, you would think that utilities would be behaving well right now, but they're not behaving well. You would think REITs were, you know, would be doing well, but they're not doing They've been bouncing a little bit lately, but uh, there's a lot of parts of the market that are in downtrends. You know, and that well, is a little bit concerning. Well, let, let's talk about one that you mentioned earlier, um, which was the gold mining uh, sector. Um, because if you've got concerns about inflation, obviously the traditional asset to buy is the hedge, is gold. Um, <clears throat> Gold is doing okay. Um, you know, it's hanging out above two thousand, um, but it it's it's not going gangbusters by any stretch. But man, the uh, the mining complex has just been, you know, breaking hearts for what the past year. Well, I would say it's been breaking hearts since two thousand twenty. It had well, yeah, a yeah. phenomenal run up. Uh, it's had some rallies along the way, but the real the, the, you know, the moonshot was back in two thousand twenty, coming out of COVID. And, Frankly, we've never made money so fast for clients as we did it with the gold miners in that period. And fortunately, we did a lot of profit taking. We should have done even more. But uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been amazing. In fact, a few weeks ago, I had a chance to spend several hours one on one with John Hathaway, who's I don't know if you've ever had John on your should be a great guest. He's a brilliant man. I have. He is. You're nodding, so you know who he is. I mean, yeah. he's, he's considered okay. to be you know, the elder statesman of the gold mining industry. And I asked him. I said, John, did you ever think that you would see gold at over 2,000 an ounce and the miners in the kind of condition that they're in right now. And he said, never, never thought that could happen. And yet it has. So it's a, uh, it is a very bizarre scenario for sure. Is that just and, because their input costs went up faster than the gold price or what, 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 why are they so unloved right now? Do you think? Well, I think you get it. They got to take a lot of blame. I and mean, they have just not been very well run. I mean, you, this is a point that that I made to him, and he totally agreed. Is if we went back to 2012, gold is gold was trading at an average price around 1,600 an ounce back in 2012, and these stocks were multiples of where they are now. Especially the, the junior miners were multiples of where they are now. The the senior miners, yeah, in most cases they were two or three times higher, and yet with gold at 2,000, their profits are lower today than they were in 2012. Now you contrast that to the big oil companies, and oil was you know 100, 100 dollars plus back 2012, 2013, and the uh, price of oil today is you know, well below that, under 80 on WTI, and yet these oil companies' profits are well above what they were back then. So the contrast versus the you know the top-tier energy companies and the top-tier gold miners is really stark and very unflattering for management teams. I mean, you just had Newmont cut their dividend yesterday. I mean, come on. <laughs> that stock looks really right on the edge of you know breaking multi-year support. It's... I don't know. I, I think they need to bring some of the energy top executives over and run some of these gold miners, personally. Hmm. But I do think they'll get it. I think I think they are realizing they need to have a new model. I think they are going to try to emulate what the energy companies have done. And it's just like with oil, it's hard to find new gold resources. And if you look at gold reserves in the ground, they are very low. And they are having cost overruns. And one of my points is, geez, one of your biggest costs is energy. And energy is quite depressed. So why are you having trouble on the cost side, which I think, again, comes back to are these guys very well run? So it's, uh, yeah, it's it's been very, very frustrating. Uh, but I do think eventually these guys will, will you know, really go into a major merger and acquisition. Some of the big guys combine and they cut costs like crazy. And 
But right now it's tough. It's much easier, I think, to be an energy bull. And maybe we'll talk about energy coming up here soon. Uh, I know you've got some slides on that. So um, I do indeed. Why don't you why don't you drive from here? OK, so if we go to the next one here. It's uh, this one is really gets very little attention. We're going to see one in a bit that gets even less attention. And that's basically looking at inventories adjusted for all these SPR strategic petroleum reserve releases that the Biden administration has done. So what you see is when you look at overall inventories, because you know that includes the SPR is inventories, which it should, uh, we're actually at a shockingly low level. And yet you don't hear that in the popular press. And as so I, I guess there's kind of three three uh, acronyms I would use to bring up that I think are behind a lot of the weakness in oil, which is IEA and then SPR that we just talked about, and then DUCs, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But on the first acronym, the IEA, as, as you know, that's International Energy Agency, and it is uh, the, considered to still be the authority on the, on the supply, demand, and overall status of the energy, particularly oil market. And they have been so wrong for so long how anybody listens to them, it's just beyond me, but they still have, uh, they have the market's ear. And yet they, their undercounting of oil demand goes back decades. They did a stealth revision back in 2000, 2019 where they revised up demand figures by 2 billion barrels. And then they just did the same thing since 2019. So they've now done another, you know, under kind of like when they do these jobs numbers revisions, they get very little press. They did another revision here of another billion barrels of increased demand. So it's just a joke. And how do they do that? Well, it's because they don't look at the developing markets. They have chronically and massively underestimated demand for oil in developing markets. Because in the developed world, OECD rich countries, uh, demand for oil has actually gone down a little bit over the last 15 years. But whatever way you want to say it, these guys have really given a, a lot of false signals and I think they give this false sense of the markets in this. They, they've also underestimated um, or overestimated supply. They consistently said there's going to be more supply produced uh, than has been happening. And I do think that the U.S. shales, uh, I, I think you, well, I know you had Adam Rosenzweig on your show here recently with my friend Newberg, and he's very much in the mind that the U.S. shales are rolling over. I mean, basically every U.S. shale oil basin has turned down already and it looks like the Permian is going to flatten out and, and start to go down here very soon, probably even this year. And that's just huge. As you know, the U.S. shales have been responsible for almost all the oil production growth in the world. Yep. And most of that has come from the Permian. And that's where let's let's take a look at the next visual we got coming up here. So I think this this is this just doesn't get any coverage at all. So this is looking at drilled but uncompleted wells. And so these were at a very high level back during COVID because uh, companies just quit producing oil. The price of oil went down to almost nothing, went negative in the futures market, was in the teens in the physical market. And so there was a high level of DUCs. So kind of like if you were, you know, home building industry, this happened briefly where there were a lot of uncompleted homes, you know, half done, let's say. And so once things perked up, the first thing they did was complete those homes. So that's really what's happened with the oil industry is they had all these half completed wells so they didn't really have to keep drilling. They could just finish those uncompleted wells. And that's what they've done. And particularly, this is this is really the most unusual visual. There's some, uh, there are a few out there that show what's happened with DUCs nationally, but this is really focusing on the Permian. And since the Permian is the most important oil basin in the country, maybe the world, it's a big deal. I mean, you just can't keep drawing these things down. So when people say, oh my gosh, look, the rate, drilling rate count is down 20 or 30%, which it is, why are we still producing, you know, close to records? Well, this is why. But this is about to run out. And once again, I think the market is very unprepared for this. We have one more that's that's maybe right. And, and, so, and so is the the implication from this is that you expect at some point, you know, there's going to be a real supply issue with oil and that's going to send the price of oil higher. Yeah, absolutely. I think there will be a supply. And part of it is because demand, despite all the negativity out there, just continues to set new records. I mean, it's probably going to run 100, 405 million barrels uh, this year. So, yeah, it's a. Uh, and this is an interesting chart. So these charts, I should give credit to Cornerstone Analytics, Mike Rothman, who's absolutely one of the best. And he has gone toe to toe with the, the IEA for years and he's been right. They've been wrong. And he's with this upper image here. He's doing this adjustment where if you look at drilled wells and these DUCs, and you see the divergence with production, you go, wow, this 
you know, that's the alligator jaw that's going to snap shut at some point. So, uh, you know, with as much bearishness as there is on oil right now, that's where I think you can get a really powerful response as some of this reality starts to kick in. All right. Um, and so, as you said earlier, you know, most viewers here probably watched the video that I did, uh, the debate between Doomberg and uh, Adam Rosenzweig. Uh, titularly, the debate was, is peak oil a real thing or a myth? Um, Doomberg was arguing the the side that, yeah, it's, it's probably an overblown concern. And his general um, outlook is that, yes, they're going to be uh, supply uh, gluts and supply droughts along the way. And yes, the price will bounce around. But for the next couple of decades, he expects kind of a slow rise up into the right in terms of, of U.S. oil production. Um, Adam Rosenzweig feels differently. And David, it sounds like you, you fall more on Adam's side of the, the debate. Absolutely. And I just don't hear too many of the critics of the oil market. And actually, Dumbrug told me he's not bearish oil. And you've heard him say that he wouldn't surprise him what the 150 or 200. So, you know, to be fair to him, but there's a lot of people that say, oh, my gosh, oil prices are going to go lower. And they're really not cheap at this point. And, you know, as, as Dumbrug noted in your discussion, inflation adjusted oil prices are extremely low right now. You know, it was... Uh, you know, back in 19, 2006, 2007, it was trading in this range. And, you know, just mm -hmm. for inflation, it's way, way down. So, yeah, I think it's a coiled spring. And I think at some point it's going to snap. I also think natural gas is quite interesting here because it there really is a glut of natural gas. It's very different than oil um, where there's actually, I would argue, a, quite an acute shortage. But uh, you're starting to see some real cutbacks in oil. I'm sorry, natural gas drilling. And uh, that's a very hated market right now. And yet, you know, we're going to, increase our exports of, of LNG by 50% next year. And that's not, you know, the Biden administration's freezing approvals for new projects, but just on existing projects, which are going to happen, that's going to be a huge increase in demand for U.S. natural gas. And part of Doomberg's thesis is you can convert gas to other forms of energy, you know, like, well, compressed natural gas, CNG, uh, which can be used as a transportation fuel. It's absolutely right. But if you start using natural gas for all these other applications, I don't think the price is going to stay down around two. I mean, actually, right now it's below that. So I think that's a very good contrarian play currently. All right. I've got another contrarian play for you coming up here. Now, this may be the most extreme opportunity in an equity market ever. And I know there's lots of reasons why. I mean, when you look at China and all the stupid policies that they've put in place in recent years, but man, it has just been an absolute devastation over there. And you've got some incredible values on some of their best, best growth stocks. And I have to say, we're, we, we've been out of China for a couple of years. It broke below multi-year support back into early 2022, which for us is a big red flag. So we did completely exit, uh, but I, we're, you know, it's tempting. It's just that I, I'm so uncomfortable with the regime that I have a hard time uh, buying in there. But if you look at the next image and you look at Hong Kong, Hong Kong market has fallen four consecutive years. And that's, that didn't even happen to the U.S. stock market during the Great Depression. And you look at it back to the level that it was during the Asian crisis and go, ah, there might be some opportunities there. But I realize that's a tricky one for U.S. investors. Well, your your colleague, Louis Gov, um, has a lot of experience investing in China. Is, is, is he saying, hey, this is the time to start looking uh, to, to pick up some value here? He is indeed. He has more of an international mandate, less of a U.S.-based uh, investor base, so or investor uh, group. That he can do that a little easier than we can do it. But uh, yes, he definitely thinks they're screaming bargains. Or but what's interesting, hearing some other people that that don't have to be, uh, don't really have an Asian mandate as Louis does, uh, and they're doing the same thing. So it, it's it, if that market moves, it could move dramatically in a very short period of time. But it is definitely high risk and would probably be just a nibble, not a chomp. And, and, and if you're nibbling in it, what would you be nibbling into? Would be nibbling into specific companies or would you be buying, you know, geographic ETFs or, you know, Chinese index ETFs? I would probably do individual companies and try to pick their very best. And, and particularly where you don't necessarily have, you know, maybe where it's more multinational. So even if the, the Chinese economy continues to struggle, that the, the business is strong enough and diverse enough that it can still do well. But you know, we're just kind of we're kind of sniffing around that right now. So I don't have any uh, great ideas there. What we have coming up here uh, in a moment is more interesting, I think, for U.S. investors. And it gets back to what I've talked about with breakouts. 
because again, we look at breakouts and breakdowns. And the, the breakdowns are those that have, as Paul Tudor Jones calls them, range expansions that are on the downside. So if you see a stock or a stock market that's been trading you know, for several years within a tight trading range and it breaks that to the downside, which is what happened with China back in 2022, you better get out. They almost always get pounded after that. And conversely, if you see something that breaks above a multi-year trading range, and uh, particularly if it's an all-time high, you really get uh, interested. And there's a number of those that are happening in the U.S. We've got an image coming up here of one of them, uh, T-Mobile. And I'm not telling people to buy T-Mobile. Uh, it's a little bit extended right now, but that is a pretty impressive breakout. And one of the things that I like to see about stock price breakouts is that they coincide with earnings breakouts. So in other words, it's an earnings-driven breakout. And NVIDIA is like the ultimate example of that. It was one of the few early tech stocks to actually make a higher high than it had been in 2021. And that was a pretty darn good you know, buy signal. And there's a number of uh, companies that are doing that today in the U.S. market that, that have charts very similar to T-Mobile. And just to, and I'm not, again, not saying people should buy these. They should do their own research. And these are it's just kind of a, a watch list, shopping list. But Chubb, uh, I think there's a very interesting story with insurance companies currently. Uh, AIG, Snap-on Tools, uh, PBF, which is a big refiner, really interesting story there. Diamondback Energy, amazingly, in the energy patch, a company that's making a new all-time high. Berkshire. Warren Buffett's company making a new all-time high. Uh, Shell Oil, another you know pretty remarkable achievement in the energy area. J.P. Morgan, I call it kind of jokingly Jamie Morgan, Jamie mm -hmm. Diamond's bank. Uh, Siemens, Microsoft. I think you got to say Microsoft's chart pattern is pretty impressive. And again, a lot of that's been earnings driven. It's it's the most expensive name of the ones I just mentioned, but it's got momentum and you know, at least a you know decent valuation considering what's going on with their AI exposure. So anyway, that's a few things for people to take a look at. All right. Well, look, so you are a capital manager. Um, you manage client capital. So you, you can't just have an opinion. You actually have to put it into, into action. And, and you've got the responsibility of, of safely stewarding your, your client's assets. So, um, you know, you, you've got some concerns about where the economy could head, where markets could head, but, but we don't have the luxury of trading or investing in the markets we wish we had, we have to invest in the markets as they are right now. So are you putting capital into companies like the ones you just mentioned there? Are you, are you, yes. are you, are you using some of that momentum, but, but trying to find companies that have valuations that are defensible right now? Yes, we are. I'd say we're kind of maintaining our cash level where they are, where it is, which is relatively high. So we, we still like the T-bill and chill idea. Uh, just, you know, it's a, it's a crazy world out there and who knows? Hey, Bill and Chill. I love it. I hadn't heard that before. I'm going to steal that. Really? Uh, no, that's, uh, I, I wish I could take credit for that, but I, I stole that from somebody else. But yeah, it's, so the idea is that right currently what we're, we're trying to do is we're, we've got a lot of stocks, fortunately, that have really had big runs. So we're taking some profits. Typically, we just trim. We don't very often get out all together. Uh, and we're, but where we are getting out all together, some companies that are breaking down where they are breaking to new lows and recycling that into companies that have got you know, attractive valuations. A lot of those companies I just rattled off are, you know, kind of trading in the 10 to 15 times earnings range, amazingly. And so recycling that, uh, you know, the area that, that where we really have done the best for our, our clients over the years has been with income investments, bonds, and, and other high yielding securities like the pipelines. Uh, you know, somebody referred to me recently, oh yeah, you're the MLP guy. And, and we have <laughs> liked MLPs for a long time. And uh, people still kind of think they're in the doghouse, and yet they just made a new multi-year high and have been, I mean, they were up 25% last year. Hardly anybody knows that total return. So yeah, that is our area of strength. That's where we've had really fine return numbers. And so thank you for bringing that up. No, well, let's let's talk a little bit about that, about your offerings there. So um, this week, uh, I interviewed and, and released the interview with Stephen Bavaria, who uh, wrote the book, The Income Factory. And basically the, the, the discussion is basically just a deep dive in, into how to set up an income producing portfolio, um, hopefully with lower risk. Um, and uh, I, I reached out to him because I, I just, one of the top questions I keep getting uh, asked for by this, this audience, which is, hey, can you do uh, an interview or, or several uh, videos on income investing? And the feedback to the interview with Steven has been, been very, very high. A lot of people saying, yes, this is the practical type of guidance I'm, I've really been looking for. 
Um, and I think I think there's a strong interest uh, in income for for a bunch of reasons. One, I think a lot of viewers here are skeptical of how stretched equity valuations are getting right now. Um, but a lot of them as well, um, you know, we're, we're in an era where you can actually get pretty good yields now on, on a lot of credit that that were harder to get during a, a ZERP era, right? Um, but also, you know, for uh, a good chunk of my audience, two thirds of it is 45 years and older. These are people who have wealth. Their, their, their number one mandate is to not lose the wealth that they have and to try to, to live and hopefully retire off of it. And, and that's why income is so important. And for a lot of those people, you know, they don't have a ton of experience dealing with a lot of fixed instrument, fixed income instruments. And so they're really looking for solutions where they can have a quarterback kind of run it for them. So I think folks would be interested in what you guys do there. So uh, I know you sent me over some, a couple just quick slides uh, about your different strategies there. Should I pull those up now or later? Yeah, go ahead. So this is income replacement where our main mandate is to create high return. We don't worry as much about volatility and it has had a much better performance record than the, the Barclays uh, aggregate bond index, but with more volatility to be fair. Now, the next one that you've got is, well, that there we go, principal preservation, which it is all bonds. So it doesn't have MLPs or pipelines or you know, high equity, high income equities. It has just bonds. Uh, the current yield on that's about 6%. And so if somebody's looking to get a 6%, maybe a little bit below that right now, just because of the decline of rates we've had recently. But it's a, it's a very attractive place to be if you're, you know, you want that cash flow, but you want to have downside protection. Now, in fairness, what's happened since October, because as I mentioned, it wasn't just stocks that have moved, corporate bonds have had a tremendous uh, appreciation. We've got a number that are up you know, 20% from where they were in October on a total return basis, almost equity-like returns. And, and that is one thing about the bond market is if you pick your spots pretty well, you can get equity-like returns. Now, I would say this is not one of those times. We've had that big appreciation Credit spreads, as I said earlier, have come down. They're kind of tight. So I think this is a time to be you know, relatively defensive. Uh, but you know, if you get a, if you buy a bond that's due in a few years and you're going to get a five and a half or six percent yield, even if it goes down a little bit temporarily, you're not going to be too upset. I think where you really have to be careful in the bond market is with really long maturities. If I'm right about my bond market riot thesis coming up. And also, Adam, I would say you're exactly right. It's people can you know pick stocks, and unfortunately, tend to pick pretty much the same stocks. Uh, you know, individual investors' portfolios are very concentrated, as we've been discussing, much like the market. But it's tough to manage money in bonds. It's really a challenge to even find them. I mean, it, you know, we'll, we provide our newsletter. We provide names of bonds that you might want to check out, but it's hard for people to find those. So I think when it comes to professional money management, it's even more critical in the bond and yield instrument area than it is in the equity market. Thanks. And that's echoing something that Stephen was saying, which is, um, you know, he, he in building his own income factory, uh, he doesn't go to look for buying individual instruments himself. Um, he goes and, and basically tries to buy fund managers. And he's, he's basically like, look, you know, I, I work with the biggest guys, with the guys that have the greatest advantage to find, you know, they've, they've got the smartest analytical teams and sometimes can structure deals that that a small fry can't put together. So he, you know, reiterated your point, which is um, you know, you 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 really don't want to kind of go this alone um as an inexperienced investor. You want to leverage the expertise of somebody who's got a, a really good track record in investing in this space. Please send them our way. I think well, all right. So let's let's, let's, let, let's talk about that. So we're we're uh, here at the end of the hour, um, David, as, as always, you just leave it completely on the field. Thank you so much for giving such a, a great uh, uh, you know, dive into all the things that you're looking at right now and the decisions that you guys are making as capital managers. Um, uh, for folks that are, are interested in learning more about you, following you and your work after this interview, where should they go? And, and in your answer, for folks that have maybe looked at those those fixed income strategies and saying, hey, that's kind of interesting. I'd like to learn more about that. Tell them where they can go for that as well. Well, it's a great point because I've actually, as you know, wear two hats. So one of them is as co-chief investment officer of Evergreen GovCal. So that's our partner firm again, GovCal Research. And they can go right to our website, Evergreen GovCal website, and uh, they can find all kinds of information on our various strategies. Uh, they can certainly uh, email me. Uh, and um, this is where I'm going to talk about my other hat, 
which is David Hay, the Haymaker, Haymaker underscore Substack is where you can find that. And you can easily contact us there. So it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit of an unusual setup, but I, I do think that one of the advantages I have as a newsletter writer is the fact, as you said, I, for you know, many, many years, many decades, I've actually been managing money and a lot of my uh, newsletter writing peers don't do that. And unfortunately, there's some restrictions that come with that. I have to be very careful about what I recommend. And that's why I try to avoid direct recommendations as opposed to just kind of pointing out things that look interesting. But thank you for that lead in and thank you for all your great questions. It's, uh, it's always such a pleasure to talk with you, Adam. Oh, thank you, my friend. Uh, it's a privilege on my end as well and on the audiences to get to hear from you. Um, so just to make sure folks completely understand. So, uh, you know, David writes his Haymaker uh, newsletter over at Substack. And David, when I edit this, I'll put up the links to both websites on the screen so folks know exactly thank what you. it is. Thank you. Um, but but and uh, I'm a subscriber to it. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful publication. And so if you want to stay up to date with where David sees the puck heading, you go to Substack, you sign up for that. Um, if you're interested in perhaps having um, some of your capital managed by uh, David's firm, and uh, specifically, you know, if you're particularly interested in those fixed income strategies, that's where you go to evergreengolfcall.com and, and end up talking to somebody there with your questions, correct? Correct. All right. All right, David. Well, look, um, I've got one last question for you, and I'm going to give you about 30 seconds <clears throat> to think about it. And that's that we've been talking all about money and finance uh, so far in this conversation, a little bit about energy. Um, but uh, uh, I'm very curious. I've been asking this question to other recent guests. Um, you know, you're a worldly man, successful gentleman. Um, what's one non-money related investment that you would encourage folks to consider adopting in your life? And while you chew on that, I'm just going to do a quick uh, little uh, series of housekeeping. One, if you've enjoyed having David on this program, would like to have him come back anytime he sees something uh, material on his uh his dashboard there that he'd like to share with us, please let him know that by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And a reminder that the uh, uh, Thoughtful Money Spring Conference is coming up fast now, and you only have a couple days left to lock in uh, the lowest early bird discount price uh, for that uh, conference. The conference itself takes place on Saturday, March 16th. If you can't actually watch live that day, don't worry about it because we'll send replay videos of the entire event, including uh, both the presentations and the live Q&As uh, to everybody who registers within 24 hours of the event. Um, but uh, if you want to, if you, if you uh, act quickly, you can, like I said, lock in that lowest early bird price discount. And if you're a premium subscriber to our Substack, you get an additional $50 off of that price. Um, so uh, to go lock that in, just go to our Substack, uh, put up the URL to it right here. And uh, again, it, I think it only costs $15 a month to subscribe. Happy if you spend 15 bucks uh, just to save the 50 and pocket the $35 yourself. I just want you to get the lowest price. Uh, and then uh, just as I do every week, I highly encourage everybody who's uh, the vast majority of people who are watching to navigate this uncertain road ahead, uh, following the guidance of a good professional financial advisor who understands all of the risks that, uh, that David talked about here. If you're interested in talking to David and his firm, you know, go to evergreengolfcall.com. Um, but if you, and if you've got a good one who's already doing this for yourself, great, stick with them. If they're, they're doing a good job, they're really worth their weight in gold. Um, but if you uh, think you'd be helped by it, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Thoughtful Money endorses. To do that, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com. These are the same financial advisors you see with me on this channel week after week. Lance Roberts and his team at Real Investment Advice, the guys from New Harbor, and the guys from Rock, Rocklink Financial from Canada. Uh, and just a reminder, these uh, these free consultations don't cost you any money. There's no commitment to work with these guys. They just sit down with you, hear about your personal financial situation, tell you what they think you should do. You can go off and do that yourself. You could give that insight to your own financial advisor and say, hey, I like these guys' ideas. I want to do this. Or you can keep talking to the guys if you want to. It's just a free public service that they offer. All right, David, with all that housekeeping out of the way, uh, what non-money related investment would you encourage folks to think about? Well, you called me worldly, which was very kind. Really elderly would be more appropriate, no. uh, having been in the business 45 years. But uh, you know, that actually is kind of a good lead into what I was going to say, which when I think back about my life and, and how when I had very few advantages when I started out uh, in the business, I was probably the least likely to succeed, succeed in the financial industry. In fact, I shouldn't say this, but it's absolutely true. My degree 
was in cinema studies and filmmaking from the University of Washington, not even USC or <laughs> UCLA. So not exactly the right thing to go into the financial industry in, in the late 70s when, when I joined. But older people, that's really the point I was going to make. I have had so many benefits from older people. And I would say that, you know, our society has become so youth oriented and maybe that's starting to shift a little bit. But I would say, you know, invest in, in and really treasure the older people in your lives. Try to learn from them and, and just you know, appreciate them. Great point. And that's something I've talked a little bit about in this program, but I'm so glad that you're you're adding voice to it now, which is that um, culturally, uh, historically in our culture, and certainly in most cultures around the world, you, you had the, the benefit of the wisdom and the voice of the elders um, that would influence the decision making of, 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 of the younger people as they came into power. It was sort of a you know, a, a generational wisdom that was passed, you know, down uh, generation over generation to hopefully help the culture make better and better decisions as time goes on. It goes on. And it seems we really lost a lot of that now um, for, for one reason or another. And you said we, you know, we're a very youth obsessed culture. Um, we all think we have all the answers to the world in our pockets here. Instead, we tend to use this stuff for very superficial reasons. Um, and yeah, there's a there's just a, a massive wealth of of knowledge and perspective that uh, is just sitting there untapped by a lot of society today. And I think my generation, the boomers, were particularly guilty of that. And that's a great point that, that Neil Howe brings up in his book is just how we just try to move away from everything our parents believed in, and how the millennials are very different that way. And I, I think that's really bullish for America. I think millennials are going to lead us out of this fiasco my generation has got us into i hope so i think, right. you're, I think you're an xer aren't you you're not a boomer you're an xer i'm an xer yeah yeah we're the ignored ones who who just want to be left alone and watch the world burn but uh, but that's right you were the guys who said don't trust anybody over 30 right and I, I have to say i was not of that mindset i just i valued the you know the older influences of my life greatly and that was a tremendous benefit for us maybe the only thing i had going for me at the beginning of my career well, I, I got to tell you, personally, I have benefited uh, extremely by the strategy that you're recommending here, um, just leveraging the the expertise, the experience and the insight of those who have gone before me and, and learned from the School of Hard Knocks, um, particularly learning about not, not just what to avoid, which is obviously very useful, but but hearing from them what really works. Um, you know, you can save yourself years to decades sometimes of, of frustration and hard learning if you just listen closely to the you know, people who are willing to share uh, their success stories with you. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for sharing your insights with us, my friend. Look forward to having you back on the program anytime you'd like to come back on. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Adam.